Today, we dive into how sous vide can be used with world cuisines and what is it really like on the Food Network, next on Exploring Sous Vide. Hey there, I'm gonna double check that we are live on Facebook. We wanna make sure that this uh, is broadcast properly. We have a great, great guest today that I can't wait to dive into some of the amazing things that they do. It's probably the most impressive bio of any guest, narrowly edging out uh, Chef James Prichion and his artificial intelligence work that he had been doing. So it looks like we are live. I see people starting to comment and showing up on Facebook there. So hey there, I'm Jason Logston and this is Exploring Sous Vide. We're all about helping you get the most out of your sous vide machine while talking to some of the biggest names in the industry. Today's episode is brought to you by my very own sous vide made easy on demand cooking class because sous vide isn't magic. Like most cooking methods, gaining confidence comes from a little bit of knowledge combined with practice. Once you understand a surprisingly small amount of basic information, you'll be able to trust yourself to regularly turn out amazing food with sous vide. And to help you get started, I've assembled all the information you need to know into this comprehensive cooking class. More than 15,000 people have used this information to level up their sous vide game. So with sous vide, you never have to cross your fingers and hope your food turns out perfect. So level up your food sous vide game today at afmeasy.com slash made easy. And remember, all these episodes are available as a podcast on your favorite podcast player, or you can join us live when we record these episodes. You can ask the guest questions, talk to the other cooks in the comments, and even see our smiling faces. Got some people joining us. Ron Miller. How's it going, Ron? Rosemary Simpson. Uh, Mike Bailey. My partner, Mike Lashardi, is joining us. He's in the car, so his commenting might be limited, which is always a shame when we can't hear all of Mike's witty comments. <laughs> So join us live at afmez.com slash show or search for Exploring Sous Vide on your favorite podcast platform. Now, on to the show. Many of us in the States use sous vide for traditional American fare, like steaks, burgers, and chicken. Sometimes we get crazy and we incorporate sous vide into some Italian or Mexican cuisine. But there's a whole nother world out there to explore. Luckily, today's guest is the perfect person to help us out. He is a world-renowned broadcaster, food writer, speaker, and author who has dedicated the second half of his time on this planet to fulfill his ambition to go everywhere, eat everything. It's a journey that has taken him to all 50 states and to dozens of countries around the world. He's currently the restaurant critic for Time Out Los Angeles and has written hundreds of articles for such outlets as The Guardian, FoodNetwork.com, The Times of London, and Saute Magazine. He also has written three books, Eat My Globe, Eating for Britain, and Fed White and Blue. He's also a well-recognized television personality, regularly appearing on shows such as Guy Fieri's Tournament of Champions, Iron Chef America, Supermarket Steaks, Guy's Grocery Games, Cutthroat Kitchen, Beat Bobby Flay, Cooks vs. Cons, The Next Iron Chef, The Best Thing I Ever Ate, and Eat, The Story of Food. He's also the creator, writer, and host of the hit food history podcast, Eat My Globe, Things You Didn't Know You Didn't Know About Food, which is produced in cooperation with the UCLA Department of History. Uh, the sixth season will begin in April of 2021, and he's also the keynote speaker for our upcoming Sous Vide Summit in August. So I can't wait to learn from today's guest, food writer and broadcaster, Simon Majumdar. Simon, welcome to Exploring Sous Vide. Hello, how are you? Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> well, I love having you involved in the uh, the ISVA in general, and especially the upcoming sous vide summit. You have a, a wealth of experience with cuisines the, the world around, and it's great to bring some of that in for our organization. Thank you. Well, I, I love sharing, and it's actually been a great series of experiments for me as well, trying to apply kind of the sous vide way, as it were, to some of the dishes that I've loved from around the world and seeing where it works, where it benefits, and, and sometimes, quite frankly, where it doesn't. So, you know, I think it's been um, it's been a great learning experience. And I'm, I'm a believer, however long we've been in this business, you know, as a professional food person, that if you, if you stop learning, then you might as well just give up. So for me, it's been actually something that's really inspired me too. And hopefully I can give some inspiration to others. I'm sure you are. I've seen a, a sneak preview of your your slide deck for the conference, and it's got some amazing stuff in there. And like you said, we're big proponents of try every try cooking everything in different ways, and some stuff works and some stuff doesn't. And I can't wait to dive into all the amazing things that you've done. But before we get started, I always like to ask, what is it like around your dinner table on a typical day? 
Well, we tend right now, and certainly during the pandemic, we tended to have uh, kind of lunch has been our biggest meal uh, because we wanted to eat earlier. Uh, you know, my wife is an attorney. She's doing some freelance attorney work. She kind of has demands, shall we say, she puts on me for when she, she needs to be fed. And I'm very cognizant of the fact she's an attorney and I go, yes. And so... Um, so we, we tend to do that and we tend to watch the news from the previous day or we'll watch a, a show or we've been very, very casual about it. Uh, but I will say throughout my life, um, kind of sitting down and having meals with people I, I'm either related to or care about very much has been something that has been not just important to me, but vital to me. That kind of breaking bread, for want of a better way of putting it, is, is absolutely vital for me. So I'm glad now that we're actually getting out, back out and being able to do that again. I can definitely relate to the food needs to show up when food needs to show up. My wife's the, yes. she's the news director at uh, CBS Sports, and it's very much like, <laughs> these are the windows in the like eight hours of Zoom calls when she has a half hour that she could shovel some food in. So we have to do that. And then we generally have a nice dinner at like 8.30 when she gets off in the evening. <laughs> Yes, our, our, our evenings are probably more fueled with a nice glass of red wine. <laughs> it's always but a, very a... much. So I was going to say very much as an attorney, my wife is, I'm on this billing window and this is my gap. <laughs> Have food there. And it doesn't matter what I do or how you know, kind of well-known I think I might be in other circles. If my wife demands X at X, my wife gets X at X. And I think that's a good lesson for every, every gentleman in the world anyway. That's definitely a good strategy that I have also found success with. She she gets what she wants when she wants it, and then we all are happy. <laughs> have a few more people join us. Ron Miller says he just pigged out last night on some 72-hour short ribs. That's always oh, fun to get a nice. shot. We got my lovely mother, Barb Logston, saying, hey, from Philly. She's trying to keep the riffraff in line in the comments. You know, She smacks down anyone <laughs> that's, that's hey. mean to her dear son. Never argue with anyone from Philly. That's a that's a great town, but they know they know what's what in Philly. That's the other reason my wife uh, has me trained well. Is she, she was born and raised in Philly, so she she doesn't take any any guff from anyone. <laughs> great eating city. Also got Lisa Keys joining us. Uh, Lisa does some amazing recipe development work, and she's done some crazy things with sous vide. That speaking of trying everything, she's you know steam baked entire cakes in her sous vide machine and a bunch of things like that. And she's won a lot of recipe contests uh, all around the country. So it's great uh, always seeing what she contributes. Um, and that's what I love about this. There's so many different ways you can use sous vide. And I'm excited to hear some of your experiences because you've traveled the entire globe. What are some places that really stood out to you when you visited them? Gosh, well, I mean, I think I've been very fortunate. So about oh, many moons ago, 15, 16 years ago, and I really quit my job in publishing. I said, I'm going to, I have a, a phrase, go everywhere, eat everything. You mentioned it. And I decided to go around the world. So I'm, I'm approaching 100 countries now and I go there for food. So I'm very fortunate that I've been to some amazing places. Um, I think there are certain cuisines that we, yeah, we know are going to be exceptional. I'm a huge fan of Spain. Obviously, Italy is incredible. We know about we know about Europe, and you know because we're probably more. A lot of people may obviously have relatives who've come from there, and we we know a lot about that. Uh, obviously, we know a lot more now about Southeast Asia. So you know, people coming from Thailand and South Korea, and obviously we have a huge Korean population here in Los Angeles, which is fantastic and some great food. But also some of the areas that people may not know as much about. So. You know, I'm a huge fan of the Philippines and the Filipino cuisine. My wife is Filipino-American, but long before that, I'd fallen in love with the country before I even met her. And I think the food from the Philippines is some of the most underrated in the world. I think uh, I would also put from that area Taiwanese food. I think is uh, people kind of conflagrate it with Chinese food, and I think it's very different, and I think it deserves its own recognition for some amazing food. Um, I think going into areas that we sometimes kind of go, oh, you know, what is that? So I, I love places like Eastern Europe, uh, places like Russia. We don't talk a lot about kind of Russian cuisine because we assume it's kind of borscht or whatever. But actually, it's such a varied country because you're going from Asia through to Europe and all points in between. And you're getting really exceptional food throughout some of those, some of the best smoked fish I've ever eaten. Um, 
also i kind of like to stand up for britain you know britain has a bad reputation which it has deserved in the past but i think people who've been to britain will say i will say quite frankly i think in terms of produce meat i think britain is better than the us in terms of, not in quantity obviously but in terms of quality the produce that we have more artisanal cheese makers in britain than they have in france so i think britain is kind of an upsurge now london i would put as one of the great eating cities in the world um you know, I'm a big fan of Scandinavia. So, you know, Finland is not a country, again, that gets a lot of kind of praise, but incredible smoked fish, incredible game that you don't get a lot of here in the US, particularly if you're in urban areas. So, you know, when we go to cities, our, our, most recently or relatively recently, we're in Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia. And the food in uh, Azerbaijan, a little less so, but Georgia and Armenia, just incredible food and great wines. You know, Georgia was the founder, really, of natural wines that we, you know, we talk such a lot about now that they they ferment in these big uh, amphora, like Roman amphora, that they've been doing this, obviously, for centuries and centuries and just incredible food. So for me, I think whenever I set foot in everywhere, I think about, yeah, you know, the Pope used to get down on his knees uh, and kiss the ground. And I think for me, it's kind of I go and find the nearest kitchen. And that's how I consider myself to have been somewhere for food. Um, I'm, I'm super excited to be getting out there again. My wife and I are planning to walk as much as we can along the old spice road from China all the way through Persia, what was Persia and then down towards Spain, obviously where it's safe and we're not going to put ourselves into any unnecessary danger. Um, and I'm just excited to be getting down, getting out there again. And we're already planning. Yeah, it's great that things are opening up again. I want to talk about a few of the cuisines that you mentioned because there's so many interesting <laughs> ones there. I had never had Filipino food until uh, one of our best friends in the city, Lem, is Filipino, and he's introduced us to some Filipino restaurants and some of the cuisine around here. And it, it is fantastic, really, really good, interesting food. What's one of your favorite dishes from the Philippines that you think people should give a shot to? Wow. Well, it, it's such a varied uh, cuisine because actually a lot of its influence comes from Mexico. So a lot of the early governors of the Philippines were Mexican Spanish uh, who came over from Mexico. So it's got a really fascinating cuisine. I actually interviewed someone there on my podcast. I mean, there are the classic uh, cuisines. People might think of adobo. They might think of lechon, the, the whole pig. They might think of uh, lumpia, the, the egg roll style dish. They might think of some of those salads. But for me, it's all about freshness. It's about the use of hot, sweet, sour. Uh, so for me, there's one thing called bagnet, which is like a little pork belly that uh, you put a little sauce on, a little bit called, it's called mang tomas, and it's made out of liver, and you'd add that to a bagnet. Um, I love the use of the fish. They do a lot with milkfish, and particularly they crave things with a little bit of fat in them. So the belly of a milkfish, the belly of any fish to me is just like the most delicious. Probably if, if my wife and I ever kind of fall, fall out with each other. It's probably because we've argued over the belly of a piece of fish. Um, <laughs> she loves that. Uh, to me, it's use of root vegetables. Uh, they have dishes like pinak bet. They have immense amount of noodles. And I will say, and I, I think I, I'm in a position where I can give at least a valid uh, argument towards it. There are so many countries where people just adore food, like a sheer joy. I'm not talking about gluttony, just adore it. We think of Mediterranean countries. We think of a lot of you know, uh, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, I have never been in any country where the sheer passion for food is anywhere that I've seen this close to the Philippines. I've never, uh, yeah, and that doesn't mean that other countries, like I said, don't. But I have never, to the point where their obsession with food is, I joke with my wife, almost a sickness. And when you go for food, the amount of food that they will put in front of you and the disappointment they will give you when you don't go back for your 19th you know, serving of X is really incredible. Um, so it's, it's uh, and I think what that brings into it a lot for me is yes, it's the food, of course. Uh, you know, and we've, I know we've got chefs and fantastic home cooks watching, but for me, it's about the context as well. For me, great food isn't just food that you, you know, that's tasty in of itself. It's food that you have in context. So meals that I've had in Senegal, and I, I've got a Senegalese dish in my keynote speech, meals that I've had in, you know, um, Dubai, meals that I've had in, you know, Mozambique, um, they're, they're, when they're served in context by people showing you real hospitality, it kind of shows you, I think to me anyway, as a traveler, that however different we think we are from people, we're really not. And so that's kind of part of the key for me. 
I think that's really funny talking about the passion they have in the Philippines for food because our friend Lem is like, he knows the best X of any place in New York. He he has a whole mental list of the best places that you can go to. So I could see that where he gets that passion for food from. Uh, what are some things that you've tried that you think people need to work more into their home cuisines? There's a lot of great stuff out there and some of it's hard to kind of incorporate, you know, without sending away for ingredients and some things you can't find. What are some things people should explore more in their own cooking? Well, I think two things. Uh, what you need to do, I think, when you cook is you need to realize the purpose of an ingredient. It's not just going in there because. So, you know, I talk to people who do barbecue and they use salt and I go, well, you could try soy or there's other salting ingredients. And so what you'll see is that each of the cuisines that I'll talk about, and when I talk about the keynote speech, they're using things that are trying to recreate flavors and tastes that we all know. They're just different ingredients. So I think think about that for a start. So if you use cayenne pepper, then why not go and use Korean gochujang, which is that wonderful soy fermented chili paste that's really deep and rich and savory and comes up and they use it traditional barbecue but you could use that in a barbecue sauce you could use that in uh, a braising for fish i've used it in all kinds of things i've used it as a glaze for chicken um you know i think a lot about spices i'm obviously half indian my father was from calcutta so if you you can't see it here but my kitchen there is just a ray with whole spices and i talk about grinding spices and dry toasting them the smell that comes off Rather than, and I do have ground spices because sometimes, quite frankly, if if I am being demanded of food in the house and I need to do something quickly, I'll use them. But if I have time, I will grind and dry and gr uh, toast and grind the spices and the smell that comes off in the house. is like something you'll never have experienced before. So if you are a real foodie, I would go, look, these days here in the United States, you can get anything. You can go on Amazon and you can get any, and I've done this during the pandemic when I was too afraid to leave our tiny little apartment here in L.A. I have got everything delivered from whole ducks where I've had to you know, cut the head off. Of, well, not quite cut the head, but I have to butcher the whole things to every That's piece of That's what the FedEx guy does, right? He's the one that cuts yeah, off like, the head for you. And stands, there with the, stands there with the head. But no, I've got wonderful, wonderful uh, Asian and uh, Latin ingredient suppliers uh, just that we found and you know, all the people from, you know, Eurasian markets will supply Costco using everyone. Oddly enough, the best basmati rice that I have bought and used, I bought a bulk of it. Again, being Indian, I need to have rice on hand. Otherwise, I feel a little bit unsafe. I need to have a, but I get huge, huge bags of it from Costco, the basmati rice, and it's incredible quality. And I am not being endorsed by Costco. Um, so I think go and do some research and the research is the fun. You know, I think if you're re if you put it this way, if you're if you're prepared to go and go through the kind of vagaries of learning sous vide, I know you're the person who's going to go out there and want to have great ingredients. So just go and experiment. But what I do, what I remember is I think it was uh, Miles Davis and I may have got the person wrong who said about playing jazz. He said, before you play jazz, you need how to learn to play the piano. And I think about that with cooks. I think about it with painters, musicians, as a writer. You need to know the basics. So go and look at some of these ingredients of cuisines you've tried before or want to try and find out why they add X into a dish and then play around with it. And it's, it's a great canvas, particularly with sous vide. I think it gives you – it's quite forgiving in the way that it helps you cook, or very forgiving often, and and – you're not going to make too many mistakes. So for that's for me is for people want to incorporate, just be really inquisitive. I love that approach to it is finding out why, what is the actual point of this ingredient and how can you use it? It's I've taken a few uh, Thai cooking classes and then I also got into uh, Chinese cooking when I had uh, uh, Kevin and Carmen Koo on from kind of cooking on the podcast and they do a ton of sous vide Chinese food uh, from their oh, like, growing yeah. up and everything. And it was just like, I was like, give me the list of what I need to order on Amazon. And I spent like $30 and got a bunch of traditional Chinese ingredients. And then I could like cook really good, interesting food that like you're saying, like the Joe Kong peppers that are just like, it's familiar, oh. but different. And just like adds this depthness and a difference that I now will use when I'm making chili sometimes, if I want that type of little change in flavor. And I see the ingredients starting to work into different to my normal cooking, not just the, that type of cuisine. 
Well, I think so. I mean, uh, Chile's a perfect example, and I haven't I haven't done one for this uh, keynote on Chile, obviously because I went more around the world. But I will now, when I'm making my chili, add just a couple of Sichuan peppercorns, which are actually they're not peppercorns in effect; they're an ash from the ash tree in Sichuan. And I've been there and seen them kind of drying on the streets. And one of the chili peppers, just one. What that does, they have a traditional kind of numbing effect on the mouth. And in fact, in those areas, they will use them as an antiseptic if you're having something done with your teeth. They'll actually create a, a kind of a gel out of them. Uh, but one or two of those in the underneath of a chili will, will give you this look that when people taste it, they're not having something they don't like, but they're going, oh, what is that? And I love that because I go, well, what do you think? And usually they'll figure it out or the one pepper, the citron pepper, uh, uh, one uh, chili in there, which again has that slight numbing effect. And they'll see it. And I go, well, just suck on it. And their mouth starts to numb again. And so I think there's a lot of things to play around with there. And, and I think using, like I said, using chili, but why why not use other chilies as well as the more traditional things that you would put in a, a chili, which I love. And it's not because you're trying to improve it. I, I hate this word when people go, oh, I'm trying to elevate something because someone said to me the other day, elevating Filipino cuisine. I go, it's been going for you know quite a long time without needing you to elevate it. But that doesn't mean you can't go and play around with it. You know, so I'm not a great fan of saying that, but having fun with it, of course. I think that's a great distinction that you can change food without trying to make it better, just trying to make it different and interesting and try new things. And it's a great way to kind of experience cuisines with you don't always have to be reaching for some platonic ideal of chili or of, of any dish. It can just be fun. Uh, Lisa Keys says her new favorite ingredient is Szechuan chili sauce. And that was oh, one yeah. of the ingredients that I got too is the Szechuan peppercorns that are like so much fun. And it is like so interesting. I am never we if you what you can't see is we have about 30 jars of this because we eat it I mean this is hardly a day's worth for us when we're in the mood and uh, I think the key that you said there it, and, and this is the thing that I say all the time cooking and sharing food is a joy it's a complete joy with people and if if cooking the food or sharing the food is ever not fun don't do it we all have, and we've certainly learned over the last year and a half, that we don't know what's going to happen to us in our life. So within reason and being sensitive to other people's needs as well, let's have some bloody fun out there. Let's, see, let's go and enjoy our food. Let's not argue with someone because we think they put too much cayenne in this. Let's not. I'm not allowed. I don't know how. I, was, I have a rule. And I'll say it because can, you can bleep it out later. Like. In food now, apart, I mean, judging is a different thing because I'm meant to be giving people criticism, but I just don't want to be a dick. That's my rule. I'm, I'm, I just, I just want to have fun. And so when people are often worried about cooking for me, and I'm so thrilled that anyone would ever want to cook for me at any point that I'm never going to be anything less than fantastic unless they ask me for some advice based on my kind of past lessons. Uh, but let's just go and have some fun right now more than ever. Let's just j get together and have, you know, as you would do if you were having a live keynote and you guys would be having fun. I know you would because I've, I've spoken to quite a few of you. <laughs> I know you, that's what you do. Uh, and that that's kind of the bottom line for me right now. And then I'll get back to being horrible later when I get back on TV more, even more. <laughs> 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 that is something that's so true it's like my friends know that i have a bunch of cookbooks out and that i do i'm involved with the international sous vide association they're like we're so scared to cook for you and i'm like i like if you put the time and energy and like love into your food like i'm going to appreciate it and eat every bite and enjoy it and be so thankful that you did that for me i'm not going to be like well you know what like so and so could have done this better like no it's it's part of that shared process and the giving back and forth and just that, that communal aspects of eating and cooking for someone is I I'm always just honored when someone does it for me. Like I would oh. never be judgmental towards them. No, I'm, I'm uh, completely with you. I'm honored. And you know what I love as well, even more so, and people do it online as well and send me things when people go, Oh my, my grandmother, my mother, my father, you know, uh, made X. They're not with us anymore, but, I've made it for you based on their recipes and uh, I just wanted to share it with you because it's something that's really, you know, almost 
like those family recipes i've got my mother's no longer with us but i've got some of her recipes um it's almost kind of sacramental i mean they're so fundamental to who we are as families and people and i guarantee you everybody watching this with you know within reason unless they've had you know a, a different family lifestyle but has got dishes that are just quintessential to who they are and how they sit down i have one on my website um which is a red lentil dal you know again being indian and we call it in our family lsd life-saving dal it's our chicken soup it's our when i and i've made that and i do it at a lot of cooking demos when i share it with people and i often will print the recipe up on a tea towel or a you know, card or whatever and i get so many emails and so many things on twitter going i made this it's amazing and it's like johnny appleseed you're kind of going around and dotting that dish around and so when people make a dish that they absolutely you know is part of their soul their family background if you're not honored you shouldn't be sitting at that table that's a great way to put I'm, it it is it's I'm, such I'm a personal thing now. i'm ranting now sorry everyone you're you're allowed to rant. We we support uh, we support good rants like that. That's that's perfectly allowed. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's so personal to someone, and you're eating some of their history and their heritage and learning about Absolutely. what makes them them. Absolutely. And they generally it's don't a, cook it for everyone, <laughs> so it's an no, honor when they do it for you. <laughs> and it's a great way. I'm a great believer, without being political, but I'm a great believer that. And I have a saying that you can't sit at a table and tell someone you hate them when you've got a mouth full of ribs <laughs> or, or you can't say, you know, how dare you support X, but could you pass me the potatoes? <laughs> so I do think as well, food creates a level of civility that I think not many other things can. And, and here's the thing. I'm, I'm honest about it. I'm a very kind of liberal progressive guy and I came from that kind of background in England. But I've sat down with people who I know are far more conservative than I am who've become dear friends because, yes, we'll have differences on strategies of, the, of life and all of those things, but they're still great people who just happen to believe different things from me. And that's true of religion. It's true of all kinds of areas that we find to be annoyed with each other about, and we've talked about that. But food's a great way of getting around that. Yeah, it is. It is something that brings everyone together, and it's you can disagree about, the, the, like you're saying, the proper way to do a chili if you really want to, but it's still delicious, and you can both agree that having a mouthful of ribs is better than not having a mouthful of ribs. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so you're going to be our keynote speaker at the upcoming Sous yeah. Summit. I am so excited. I know Mike is over the moon. He's a huge fan of yours as well. Can you give us a preview about some of the dishes you're going to be covering? I can. So um, when Mike and, and you uh, approached me and I was like, well, I'd love to, um, but I, I'm not, I'm too much of a nouveau, as it were, in sous vide. And I'm certainly not going to come and sit in front of everybody there and start talking about sous vide techniques because I'd be tarred and feathered and walked out of the room, <laughs> even if it is virtual. Um, <laughs> but it is something for which I have. A developing passion so what i thought i would do is take 10 dishes from around the world from different regions um and try and see how they came out uh in using sous vide and how uh, i would have to alter the recipes so what i'm going to do and for people who are interested in it is, is uh, i have created the recipes as well and they're in the presentation so when i'm giving it i will flash up the recipes and people can either take a screenshot or uh, you can share them on websites. And, you know, again, I'm a great believer that unless it's a proprietary thing for a restaurant, recipes are meant to be shared. So I have no territorial thing. I'm that my recipes are there for anyone to try and comment on and alter and play around with. So we've gone to all over. So we have things like Jamaican curry goat, never call it goat curry, curry goat, um, which is this wonderful amalgam of the, uh, the, obviously the, um, enslaved experience in Jamaica, the Indian predenture, uh, indentured servant th people who came over after emancipation, the workers who came over with their curries, the local ingredients, and putting them together into this incredible 
powerful spicy stew that they use scotch bonnet peppers and so i did uh, and i've got a very good uh, asian uh, indian store near me and i went there to get amazing goat cooked it for and you'll see when i go on that um i'm going to greece to make kleftiko with lamb shanks which is just something that i cook for ever and ever and ever and what one of the things that i found was not a, a good thing because there's no good thing about the pandemic and yeah, we should think about all those people who've lost people or people who are still suffering. Um, but one of the things that I've took to advantage was I couldn't leave the house. Normally, I'm not in the house for more than three days at a time before I'm filming or doing a talk or I'm, whatever it is I'm doing or traveling. So here I, I would be in the apartment for seven days. So where, where I was looking to do something for 48 hours or more, I could do it. So I was so excited. Kleftiko is a perfect example. Or I did a beef shank uh beef bone soup which is one of the big things that they eat in taiwan with noodles and, and it's just deep and rich it's amazingly savory um i did fish dishes from india so i did a mackerel curry from kerala so just a short period in terms of the cooking but i just cooked that through um and then did this sauce with coconut and cream uh i mean i i don't i don't want to spoil it all uh now um, but I, and in fact, I haven't got, I'm just going to get the list in front of me so I can, I want to just, re, there was one other, so I'm going to get it in front of me and me being me, I didn't have it in front of me, which is just me being a bit thick, but there you go. Um, here we go. So it was, so I did a duck confit salad, which I th thought worked really, really well. So what I did was I deliberately took that over the tr uh, time you would do with duck confit. So I, uh, salted the duck and put it in the fat, put it into the um, sous vide. But I obviously just kept it a little longer. So then it just literally fell apart uh, in there. Um, oh, God. And the one that I was really pleased with, I mean, I was pleased with all of them, I have to say. I did a couple. So Senegal was, uh, they have a dish called poulet yassa, which is a slow cooked chicken dish with olives and, uh, and it has a little vinegar in there. Some of those ideas, I think, came to them from uh, Portugal as well, using the vinegars in there and a little bit of spice. And that just reminded me of being in Senegal, which is one of the countries I experienced some of the most incredible hospitality. So for me as well, it was really kind of discovering that what's the what's the book um, uh, that Proust wrote about eating a madeleine and he eats a biscuit. And it, the whole book is about the memories that eating this one biscuit brings back to him, the Proustian Madeleine. And, and for me, eating these dishes was all about that. And the other one that I really love that I'll give the recipe is um, what's called congee, a breakfast porridge that you will find in Hong Kong. You'll find lots of places in you know, Chinese related. So it's a slow cooked uh, kind of rice porridge cooked in chicken stock or fish stock or whatever. And then you just top that with dry shrimp. And I did a little deep fried garlic on top. And uh, you've seen some of the pictures. The, you know, it was, what it, what it proved to me was sous vide can go anywhere. You might have to play around with it. And there's certain aspects of it that everyone will know, like how I use garlic and how you don't use garlic because you don't want kind of raw garlic in your food. Um, the other one was a Japanese thing called kakuni which is a super slow cooked pork belly that goes slightly red, but it just completely melts in your mouth. And what I loved about that was it's a totally different texture thing. So we think about pork belly tending to have maybe a crunch because of the skin or all of those things. But this was almost like it just dissolved. It was like pork belly candy in your mouth. So those were the dishes that I've kind of got going on. And, and for me, it was a, just a thrill to be able to play around with them. Um, and I did some things that you know didn't work as well with some fish dishes, and um, where I, and I got it wrong, and so I didn't include those. But you know, I'm perfectly willing to admit that I get a lot of stuff wrong as well. I think the the best of us screw up a lot of stuff. You know, the more you try, the more you end up yeah. running into trouble. That sounds like an amazing list of stuff. Uh, Mike says he just ate lunch and now he's starving again. <laughs> um, Ron, Ron Miller agrees that kanji is awesome. Um, I've had that before as well. That's, I'm so excited to see the way that you put these dishes together because I think it's, it's so many unique things there that a lot of people will never have have done before. Um, what was the hardest hardest dish for you to adapt? Um, actually, it was the Carolyn curry, uh, so the mackerel curry. 
And so I have these beautiful mackerel steaks thick. And I love mackerel. It's just a fish that I, I really love. And it's got a little bit of oil to it. And it stands up to cooking. Um, so what I did was I marinated these the fish in turmeric and a little chili powder, tiny bit of salt. And then uh, I added, obviously, some of the other ingredients, the coconut milk and all of that. And I found that unless I was pretty precise, they they just began to dissolve. And I think with fish, you've got to be, I think, just a bit careful, even with a firm fish like that. And so I finally got it in the end. And I think the recipe that I'm going to share at the event is going to be the right one. And it, it turned out really, really well. Um, but I think, uh, you know, fish is always, I think for me, is always one of the things I'm kind of more ropey with than some rather than others. Um, what I didn't do, and maybe because, and you talked about someone wonderful who worked with cakes, um, I didn't do any desserts because, you know, I am not a, a great baker. But what I was looking at, and maybe someone can share this with me, some of the great kind of British, old school British desserts like, sticky toffee pudding i think my cooking there because traditionally you would bag those and steam them so i'm guessing there's a principle there with something like a sticky toffee pudding that could work rather well and i didn't just have the chance to do that and, and also i just thought it was going to be too much of a disaster if i came near a dessert but if someone thinks about that i'd love to share that with them and maybe we can talk about that here or during the keynote i think that's something that would work really well that it's what I found not being a big baker either is that a lot of the desserts that it does good in is things that you would generally try to maintain the temperature, either using um, double boilers or you know water baths in the oven, like steaming, things like that. You can really play around with the texture. And like I do pot de cremes and it really depends like oh. what you, what temperature you can go from like soft pudding up through like really, really firm just by changing that temperature a little bit. And it's great having that precision control and lisa keys who is our the resident uh recipe tester says she is now in on the stuffy the sticky toffee pudding she will figure that out and we will make her do maybe a presentation on that at the at the summit she's done talks before so not to put lisa on yeah. the spot but she always <laughs> comes through <laughs> well i have i have a great sticky toffee pudding recipe and i bake it you know for dinners and when i'm uh, for people's houses i do whole evenings at play, people's houses of friends where i'll do something like a potted shrimp at the beginning. I'll do fish and chips in the middle and then sticky toffee pudding at the end as a kind of British dinner. And we'll serve it with really good kind of British beer or we'll, we'll, you know, we'll have some great wine. And uh, But I always wondered whether I could do it. So I'm, I'm uh, beholden to Lisa. I can't wait to find out. Well, after the after we get off this podcast, we'll send an <laughs> intro email. We can have a, a joint recipe development. She can take yours and apply the sous vide and see what... Uh, She's another big fan of trying a bunch of things. And if it works, go for that direction. If it doesn't, it didn't work. And you move on to a better method. Absolutely. Oh, uh, Chelsea Cole, who does a lot of work with us from a duck's yes, oven. She, yes. she, wanted, she wanted to ask, what's the first thing that you cooked sous vide? Uh, inevitably, it was a steak. Uh, <laughs> and, and my history, and my history was... Uh, uh, with sous vide is, you know, is that w what I think a lot of people is, if you haven't got a lot of knowledge of it, I have a friend who uh, I'm not sure if is, is a member of yours, but is a, he's a weight loss surgeon and a, a sous vide aficionado called Dr. Terry Simpson. Mm -hmm. um, oddly enough, he's created a, a TikTok account where he talks about weight loss that's got like 500,000 followers or something crazy, more than any of the like teenage kids are on there. Um, but he um kept on kind of talking to me about sous vide and i was like hey you know i'm a cook i don't i you know all the things that we say when we're kind of being stupid oh i don't want to give my food a bath all the, all the things that i was i was kind of com hard though this may be to believe i was completely obnoxious about it <laughs> and and he sent me an anova um a few years ago and i was like okay so i had a, vac a, a vacuum machine and i did it and I will tell you now that certainly when I'm at home, I will never cook steak another way ever. You know, I, I just love doing it. And so I was like, oh, okay. And, and first of all, of course, I had to eat crow, sous vide crow, as it were. <laughs> the so, most tender got, of all crow. Yeah, the, yes, it was. It was sublime. Well, it wasn't sublime because apologizing to Terry about anything uh, is, is a tough one. Uh, but he was, he was quite gracious about it. And... 
and then I just began to play around with it. So now, you know, I've used it, like I said, for cooking, you know, particularly proteins. I find it amazing. Um, and what I found now is I kind of prepack things and freeze them in smaller quantities and, you know, put them in the freezer and then bring them out and do whatever it, with them. And so it's become a regular part of my, my cooking. And here's the, I do a lot of dinners for nonprofits uh, who I work with a lot. And sometimes they'll fly me to one of their big donor houses, you know, the houses one, they tend to have great kitchens, but I will always, always take uh, a couple of sous vide machines with me and I will cook. If it's just ribeyes, that's what I'm going to do, but I'll cook other things, lobster tails, you name it. And uh, the only thing I can't necessarily do are the longer cook things just because I'm not there long enough. But yeah, but I, it's become it's become so, uh, you know, such a part of what I do, not to the extent I'm sure, excuse me, not to the extent I'm sure of some of the people who are watching this who are, you know, gen like yourself, are genuine experts, but it's something that I'm constantly curious about. You know, I got a book from you guys that I've, you know, read from cover to cover numbers of times looking at ideas and trying to apply those to dishes that I've found from different parts of the country. So, you know, it's it's become a, a, an important part of my cooking repertoire, certainly. I always like to say there's things that you can pretty much only do in sous vide. And then there's things like those steaks and proteins that it just removes any stress or mental energy to do it with sous vide. And you can just... You know, like there's a lot of people that could cook a really, really good steak, but they have to pay attention most of the time unless they work at a steakhouse, right? Well, what I found as well is um, a lot of restaurants are doing, you know, sous vide with some of their steaks if they're not a particular steakhouse where their, you know, their kind of point of view is cooking fresh from on the grill. A lot of people are getting their steaks to X point and kind of finish icing them down and finishing them off. So. You know, it's something that the restaurants have been using for a long time anyway. So, you know, me seeing how much it's being used in different environments is fantastic. I've done it with, you know, fantastic shell on shrimp. I've done it, you know, played around with it a lot. And I'm going to start working on some more. This You've really inspired me to go on and think about every rest, every country that I go to now, look at some of the dishes and see what I was going to do there. I've been working on a recipe for dolmades, the vine, le vine leaf wrapped beef. And I think those would work really, really well in here in, in a tomato sauce. They would cook absolutely beautifully in that. So that's one of my next recipes that I'm going to be working on. Um, and then kind of Again, just chilling those down and taking those for dinner that I'm going to cook uh, for appetizers and things. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about doing more. I think it's fascinating seeing all the different things that it can do that just like one of our, the favorites of the ISVA is uh, Chef David Petransic from PolyScience. And he just like he does amazing bean recipes and a lot of different vegetable recipes. And I've been on email chains where a chef's like, Jason, how do I do this in my restaurant? And I'm like, I'm going to introduce you to Dave because I have no idea. I am not a, a <laughs> chef. It'll be like, here's how you can like parts that you can streamline your menu, how you can use sous vide to pre, you know, heat ahead and then chill. And like, it's fascinating seeing the different like components you can pull out that makes like streamlining your menu a lot easier for a lot of restaurants. Actually, the dal recipe that I mentioned earlier, the life-saving dal works beautifully in sous vide. Um, and uh, I wouldn't normally do it that way, not because there's anything wrong with doing it that way, but for me, the process of cooking it is so important to our family, the actual stirring of the lentils and standing over it, and that it's more about the process than anything else when I cook that. But for people who see my recipe on my website, um, absolutely beautiful in a sous vide. The creaminess of those red lentils, the way they break down, it has fresh lemons in it, which is quite unusual, and it's, it's just really, really lovely. So, you know, fantastic. I'm going to have to check that out. Dave got me on the whole um, beans and legumes and lentils kick. Oh. So I've been exploring them a little bit more these days. Chickpeas. I, I made a tagine in there and uh, that we're going to share in the keynote. And t chickpeas with tagine and dates and prunes and tomatoes and all, all, of the, you know, all of the flavors in there with the protein was just fantastic it worked really really well and chickpeas in there are amazing what i do is i will actually cook chickpeas down there themselves and they go not till they're too soft but they've still got a little bite dry them off toss them in a little bit of olive oil air fry them 
and then toss them with parmesan and parsley and deep fried garlic and have those as a little appetizer for people and the the so it has that little crunch on the outside but kind of pillowy in the middle it's fantastic that sounds amazing i am now i know what i'm doing for the next uh <laughs> when i next have people over which is a thing that can happen again finally <laughs> works really well so i want to talk a little bit about like all the amazing things that you've done like you're a regular on the food network what is it like working for the food network and you know being a part of kind of a lot of their programming it's i have to say it is one of the great kind of privileges of my life and i i never ever ever take it for granted particularly having done you know lots of other work before particularly in publishing and quitting my job in publishing many years ago to go and travel thinking i would you know come home and get another job and then suddenly finding that yeah, I'd written a book, thanks to, quite frankly, thanks to Tony Bourdain, who gave me a quote to put on the front of my proposal. Um, that helps. <laughs> and then, yeah, and well, at least it, like he, he said to me, you know, at least it means they're going to read the proposal. Um, yep. He said, you, I won't use the words that he used, but they were very Tony-esque words. But it was like, but your proposal would better be any good. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, then someone at the Food Network and my manager, who's now my still my manager, read my book. And the next thing I know, I was being invited to be on a show called Iron Chef. Now, here's the thing. I came from Britain. I didn't know what Iron Chef was. I didn't know who Alton Brown was or you know, Michael Simon. Or, but I kind of went and looked it up. I was like, oh, this is a big deal. And the next thing I know, I'm on a honeymoon in Portugal. And I get the phone call. This is many moons ago now, 11, 12 years ago, going, they want you to be on this show, the next Iron Chef. So that was the change. Yeah, I just got married, uh, living in America so I could work. And I, I came and was on the next Iron Chef, and that was it. And suddenly I'm on the beach standing next to Alton Brown and Michael Simon, both, both who I know very well. Alton is probably one of, if not my closest pal from the Food Network, a guy who I just respect more than anybody and adore. Um, but the next thing I know, I kind of, I've been doing this for, an, you know, a number of years and, I still have to shake myself when I'm standing on set with someone who I truly admire, like Alton, like Guy Fieri, who I just, I don't think there's anyone better to watch to learn how you do television. Like his ability to exude and to create and the thought processes he has, particularly on something like Tournament of Champions, I think is just incredible. I've got like so much respect for him. He's also just a very kind person, which I think is something that people don't necessarily know. Um, but when I'm there, I, I still sometimes literally have to pinch myself because I'm like, how did I get to do this? Because I know a lot of people would l love to be in my position when I get to do these shows. And so whenever they ask me, I just go, thank you very much. I have a very strict rule. I turn up on time. I'm nice to everybody. You know, very polite. I do my job as well as I possibly can. And then I get out of their way. And I, I, I try and be in every circumstance, something that my father taught me, be, as, be good, but be as low maintenance as possible. <laughs> he says, you'll get a lot more work by being low maintenance than you will by being excellent, but a pain in the rump. Um, <laughs> and so I, I get to do this, you know, all the time. And we film through some things through pandemic, which again, um, what, what that showed to me is, uh, which I already know is, you know, Food Network operate at a kind of level of excellence. If I was working for some other people, and I won't you know, name names, but other production companies outside of Food Network world, I might have been more cautious because, you know, I wasn't vaccinated. But everything that happens with, you know, Food Network is done in a kind of point of excellence. So we knew we we're going to be taken care of. You know, if I was filming with Guy or whoever, we I know that was going to be taken care of because they look after everyone who works with them and for them in the same way. So um, I, my view is whenever they want me, I turn up um, and I'll keep doing it as long as they want me to. And, uh, and, and it's what it's also done is it's created a profile which allows me to do fantastic things like this, like chatting with you and you asking me to come and do it, which quite frankly, you wouldn't have done if it wasn't necessarily for the Food Network. Um, it's also created opportunities for me to go off and do my own things like my cooking demos around the country, which I do dozens of a year. And uh, I do them uh, not just cooking because there's lots of great chefs out of there who can do demos and probably better ones than I can, but I do demos with food history. So I'll cook a dish like 
you know, I'm doing one uh, coming up soon where I'm using a lot of chilies and I'll talk about the history of chilies and how chilies went all around the world and how we take them for granted. But, you know, they didn't come to the West until the 1500s and it was the Portuguese who took them all over the world. The Portuguese took them to India, to Thailand, to China. You know, they took them everywhere and they took them to West Africa. They And the, from West Africa, it came over with enslaved people to the US in, and in terms of hot sauces and all of this kind of thing. So I'll talk about those histories, as which I will do while I'm cooking. You mentioned um, Guy Fieri, which I think is a good example of this, but are there people you have met that have like kind of those people have television personalities, like I'm different on this podcast than I am just hanging out with my wife. Have you met, met people, you know, like that and been pleasantly surprised by like, how they actually are in person versus like what their TV persona might be that they play up those attributes? No, not so much, you know, because I think I tend to be quite, you know, I'm very kind of British, relatively reserved in that sense. So I kind of sit back and everyone will chat to me, hopefully fairly pretty easily. And I, I, I never judge people by their, you know, TV personalities. There, yeah. There are some who are kind of loud and shouty, but, you you find probably in in their real life they're kind of ebullient and loud anyway not necessarily bad but just that's who they are and what tv does is kind of distill that rather than change it i i think if someone came to me and said oh i want you to kind of wear you know a cowboy hat and go talking yeehaw and, and whatever you know it, it's it's not going to work but if they go to me you are by nature a grumpy 50 something who likes telling people off if they serve you bad food. Well, at my soul, that's what I am. And so just by focusing on that and because I'm relatively articulate and they can, they can distill that element of me that's more kind of academic. Um, so that if you go and do the shows where I'm judging, you'll have some who are really amazing chefs and they'll pick up on every technique and they'll pick up, you'll have some uh, kind of bright and, enjoying and they're into the experience of it all as a judge for the people there. And you'll have me sitting there with little notepad and pen going, well, let me tell you this. You called it this, you know, sit, sit a spell. I'm going to tell you why it isn't while I kind of wave my glasses imperiously at them. And so they, what they do is they, they're very good. The producers are bringing that out of you. But what I've found, you know, guys, a perfect example. Alton is another Jeffrey Zakarian, Alex Guanicelli. Bobby Flay, they are who they are. And the reason they're so successful is A, they can all cook. I mean, and they can cook to a level that makes me want to go and sit in a corner and cry to myself about, you know, go and watch Bobby Flay. I'm just like, I'm, you know, why? Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm good. And I've, I'm not being immodest about that, but I ain't no Bobby Flay. And I'm not Jeffrey Zakarian, who barely looks like he's touching the food. And it, when it, you look at the plate, you're just, I don't know how that happened. Um, and or when you sit and talk with Alton and it's, uh, it is like being at the kind of a lecture with the most affable, genial professor. That's who he is. And when we sit and we talk, it's just something very, very special. Um, so I've just found that people are who they are, you know, and that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm, I'm, fr I'm friendly with nearly everyone, but I'm not friends with them all, but the ones that I am, they are just who they are. That's refreshing to hear. Not everyone is like that. So that sounds like a, a great group of, of characters. You talked about sitting around with some of them and seeing uh, like what they do. Are there shows that you tend to learn more like about cooking or cuisines that are just for you personally more educational than some of the other shows? Well, I'm a great believer. Um, this is going back, but to uh, back in history, but when the BBC, the first TV station was created, the, the chairman, Lord Reith, said that it had three purposes, educate, inform, and entertain. And I still think that's the same now. Um, and so what you'll find is telev television shows in different periods of history will go up and down. Right now, in terms of a lot of food, it's been entertained, and we've needed it, competition shows. And, you know, in the early days of Food Network, it was very much uh, educate, and it was Emerald, you know, and it was Bobby and it was Ming Tsai and all of those fantastic people, all of whom, you know, I know and well, not Emerald so much, but they were cooking. They were showing us how they cooked as Julia Child did. 
right now what we're beginning to see and people are moving towards is inform so now if you go on netflix you're looking at high on the hog if anyone hasn't seen high on the hog go and see it it was just an incredible show beautifully presented beautifully put together on the history of african-american cuisine and it was going through the history of black cowboys and obviously enslaved people and the gula in south carolina and going to africa with jessica b harris the great historian uh, of the origins of you know who that's where the name comes from high on the hog and a great presenter Stephen. Um, but that what that was was information so we're beginning to see this move now mind of a chef chef's table so it it, it moves between these all the time um, and for me like i was asked i was the first person ever that alton asked to go and be a guest on good eats and he was doing i think it was turkey and he did he was making a turkey tikka masala and so i have the story of chicken tikka masala which a lot of people don't know is actually a british dish it was actually declared the national great dish of britain in 2001 um and it was created the story goes in glasgow by an, a pakistani chef who had chicken tikka but uh, added tomato sauce to it because a cab driver or someone complained it was too dry anyway that's the story so alton wanted me and it's this is all aired so i'm not kind of giving away any spoilers or anything but he wanted me to come in to play the chef in the kitchen and uh, so i'm all up and there's pictures of it online and it's me i and i got to watch alton not just talk about food as he was to as the presenter but I watched him make television. What people don't may not know is that you know he went to film school. He's uh, directed commercials, films. I mean, you know, he's a very talented director. And so, to watch someone who's very good at what they do do something, mentoring. I'm a great believer in being mentored, even at fifty something. Excuse me. So seeing Guy, when I watch Guy present Guy's Grocery Games, or watch him do Tournament of Champions, and see how he interacts with the chefs and moves, and how he elevate something that they're doing or ask me the question that means i have to bring out what everyone at home is going to need to know is quite frankly it's magnificent and i'm, I'm not i'm not sure i'm good enough to do that because there are certain people who just have it in their core and and guy and Al, they, they are two that and i've mentioned them a lot mainly because they're two of the people who impress me the most on tv um but when you see them doing what they do um i actually a lot of them, you know, we had Cutthroat Kitchen. Well, Cutthroat Kitchen was just an excuse for the producers to make me dress up as Princess Leia or Spock or, you know, all the things that I, I do and Alton to have food created under the most arduous of circumstances that he never ate, but muggins here had to eat. Um, <laughs> probably the, the, the one initially was Iron Chef because what you had then was you had the most incredible chefs cooking against each other. So it was all about the food. And most recently, I will say, watching people cook on Tournament of Champions is truly incredible because you've got amazing 16 of the best and they're cooking off against each other with ingredients they don't know, with a, a style they don't know, with an ad additional piece of equipment they don't know. And for me, it's a test because I have to go, well, I have to know what all of these things are and I have to tell Guy and I have to tell the judges because the judges don't know who the chefs are and vice versa. And watching the thought processes of really extraordinary chefs, watching Michael Voltaggio, Brooke Williamson, Antonio Lafaso, you know, watching all of the, uh, you know, and then watching the judging from people like Marcus Samuels and Rocco De Spirito. I mean, even the names kind of, there's almost like a hallelujah when you say those names, they're so high up in the culinary world of the US and the world that if i don't learn something there i might as well go home so i'm always at the back of the stage even when i'm not on stage either watching it on a monitor or watching what's going on because i want to see it's great being able to be involved in some things like that that you can watch some just experts do the thing that they are experts at and that's always to me so inspirational regardless of what they're doing it's i think it's the tr it's true whatever your um your expertise is when i watch someone who can play a cello or i watch someone who it doesn't matter or i'm a writer and there are days where i read something by you know it could be on a history it could be on food it could be on anything 
and I literally have to put my computer away for the day because I feel so kind of wretched in my in my soul with my old kind my own kind of crayon like ramblings that I don't I, I genuinely sometimes you just don't feel worthy um, and I see that in cooking you know and I, I'm sure you you see it in sous vide there are those people if you've mentioned who just have this intrinsic for me using sous vide has been a battle um, in the nicest way to learn there are some people who I guarantee you just the moment they picked it up, they knew exactly what they were going to do with it and how it was going to impact everything that was inside it because they have either a scientific brain or a culinary brain or a mixture of the boat of the two. Um, and I'm, I'm not one of those people. I'm one of those people. If I, if I, if you were using a sporting analogy, I'm one of those people who you would buy because they worked hard to get to a decent level. Uh, but you always knew you could depend on them. I'm like a, I guess I'd be like a Hollywood character actor. That's what I am. <laughs> Nice. that's that's what i am and um but i'm but i'm good at doing what i do that was definitely one of the most intimidating things is being part of the international cv association and meeting some of these amazing chefs it is like you know i don't have a culinary background i'm a i'm an adventurous home cook <laughs> who fell into sous vide in this and then you know getting to see some of these people that do such amazing things and you are like my photography is not that good my cooking and flavor combinations and like none of it like lives up to a lot of what they're doing but it's still like it's good for me and it's been great to like push me and get me to get out of my comfort zone and that's something that i try to get in front of my audience too is like these people we can learn from but you don't have to compare yourself to them you can just be inspired by them take what they do and make it your own and keep moving yourself forward and doing an amazing job well here's the other thing i think on top of that and you're absolutely right that it, it if it's inspiration but most of the people, I can't think of many examples, uh, are only too glad to spend time with you and help because there's a reason why they're passionate about X. Um, you know, and I, I still have, you know, somewhere I was going through, you know, very first time, or one of the very first times I was judging Iron Chef and Bobby was cooking and he made a Hermesco sauce, which I've, you know, I make, but it was, certainly wasn't as good as his. And afterwards I just said, wow that was you know we were walking towards the dressing rooms or whatever or he was going to his dressing room and i was like that was incredible i said i make it but not not like that i don't know what and the next day i came in i think he was judging again and he just walked over and handed me a note and he just scribbled down the recipe for his romesco sauce now that's bobby flay bobby flay doesn't need to do that for anybody yeah. but he did it because that's who he is and so I think what you what you find is asking questions in a polite, kind way of people who are really good at what they do brings out the kindness in them, too. And I'm, I'm a great believer in kindness. You know, I mean, I'm sometimes tough as a judge, but that's a different matter. But being kind to people. So when I get emails and uh, requests to do stuff as much as I can, I always try and do it because I know I've been in that position and continue to be in that position. You've been great to work with from our standpoint. So I will second that that definitely <laughs> came across. Mike said being intimidated is like hanging out with uh, Gerard Bertillon and AJ Schaller from Crea who do like, you know, consulting with Michelin restaurants. And it was yep. the first time that I really met Gerard and it's like this, you know, this French dude with a French accent that is an expert in this. And I'm just, and he was like so gracious and nice to me. And I was just like blown away by that. I was like, oh, he <laughs> he's a huge deal. Like, and Crea is a huge deal. Like Starbucks yes, Bites, like they do a lot. And like, he just treated me like a peer and a, like a normal person. I was like, I, these are the type of people I want to work with and keep them involved, you know? Cool people are cool people. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of cool things, I want to have you talk a little bit about your, um, we're getting short on time. I don't want to take too much okay. of your time, but you have a great podcast out, the Eat My Globe Food History Podcast. So if you could talk a little bit about what you cover there and why my audience should also go over there and make sure they check that out as well. Oh, well, I hope they do. And, and if you like it, don't, don't forget, as they always say, to give us those ratings and reviews. Um, so what I found with TV is, you know, by the nature of it, you know, as a judge, I'm on for a few seconds here, a few seconds there. That's the nature of what we do. Um, and I wasn't able really to share my true passion, which is about food history, because everything we eat now has some history, to, has some history to it, whether it's, you know, a bottle of water that I'm drinking now, olive oil, uh, sous vide has a history. I'm actually going to add that as a uh, for my next season. Um, and so I, what I wanted to do was talk about all of the things, whether it's an ingredient, a person, an event, 
um, and to show how they have impacted the way that we eat today. So we've done everything. We've been going, we're on season six now. We're about halfway through season six, which is amazing. Uh, we've done everything on the history of fish and chips, the history of tea, the history of scotch, uh, the last meal served on the Titanic, uh, the a biography of Escoffier. Uh, we've just done one, one literally went live this Monday on the history of chili and chili peppers and hot sauce, which has this amazing... Uh, identity with African Americans traveling during the Great Migration. And uh, Beyonce talked about having hot sauce in my bag, and it was all part of this identity. Uh, we've done the history of brandy. We've got the history of military rations coming up. We did, oh, we've got so many, the, uh, the history of caviar, the history, I said, we did one recently on the history of silverware. You know, why, why something is called a knife, why is, is a knife, why forks were considered by the Italians in the 1500s to be the work of the devil. I mean, all this amazing stuff. And the way I look at it, it's called Eat My Globe, things you didn't know, you didn't know about food. So it's things that you don't need to know. You don't need to know that the man who created canning, as in, you know, the cans of Spain, was a champagne maker during the time of Napoleon, but used broken down glasses to fill with tomatoes, can them with wax, and sent them off to Napoleon's troops in Russia. You don't need to know that, but actually you'll never eat a can of tomatoes again or a can of spam again before that. You wouldn't if if you didn't know that Khrushchev said if it wasn't for the four 40 million cans of spam he was sent from uh, not Khrushchev. Yeah, it was Khrushchev. For, uh, 40 million cans of spam, Russia wouldn't have beaten Hitler during the World War. You know, it's there's just these great stories that come to us, these amazing people that come to us. Um and what I like to do is just share, you can tell, that's the way I'm talking now, I get really excited <laughs> by it, which is probably a bit sad, uh, you know, probably why I didn't date very much when I was younger. Um, but probably, but it's something that I find so extraordinary to share. And, what, and that's what I want to do. And um, we do it with the Department of History at UCLA, so they kind of check everything with me. My wife edits it. I write it. My wife edits it. I have an amazing... Um, producer april uh, who's actually married to terry simpson the doctor i mentioned earlier and so it's all connected and we just go out there and we share it we've got uh, interviews with alton brown ken burns the amazing documentarian we went to him he owns a restaurant but of course he does and being ken burns it was a magnificent restaurant small restaurant in walpole new hampshire um we've got duff an interview with duff goldman and marcus samuelson coming up soon we've got i mean we've got incredible things and we go off in all kinds of directions so if you're really interested just in food but in a kind of fun slightly geeky kind of way not scientific because i'm not good enough at, it, at that but like history why we should think of everything that we have has a history then please go and listen because uh it's we, do, we but we do it for fun you know we do it because we love doing it and sometimes i think doing things just because of the sheer passion i think it's a decided there's there was this thing in britain in victorian times there were what uh, players who were called gentlemen amateurs and they would play cricket or soccer and it was before people started making a lot of money and these were men who otherwise might have been studying at cambridge but then they went off to play soccer or play cricket or whatever and they were known as gentlemen amateurs and that's kind of how i think about myself in life i kind of i'm not necessarily Particularly great at anything, but I love. I have fun doing it, and then I go home and have a glass of brandy and you know, read a book. I want to see anything. <laughs> I want to listen to anything you do that you are that passionate. Just talking about the the product that it sounds like an amazing <laughs> podcast, and I love that kind of like interesting. You know, it's kind of off the wall information about anything. So I'm going to be definitely checking that out, and I think it's something that a lot Thank of you. our listeners would want as well. And Simon, I appreciate you coming on, sharing your expertise, sharing your passion. If people want more from you, they can find you on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Simon Majumdar or at TikTok at the real Simon Majumdar. Thank you so much for coming on. It was amazing talking to you. It was my great pleasure. I, I hope everyone's having a great time. I hope everyone's emerging uh, slowly and safely, and we're all going to be able to hang out together soon. And I will see everyone uh, August the 7th. Uh, at the keynote speech for the uh, sous vide association i'm really excited i'm really honored that you asked me to come and do it and uh, hopefully be able to answer lots of questions and share and if nothing else comes out of this today 
Jason, um, we're going to be able to make some sticky toffee pudding. Looking forward to it. I can't wait to see what Lisa comes up with. <laughs> Well, thank you to everyone in the comments and that's listening. Remember, you can join us live when we record these episodes. You can ask the guest questions, talk to the other cooks in the comments, and even see our smiling faces. So join us at afmeasy.com slash show or search for Exploring Sous Vide on your favorite podcast platform. This has been Exploring Sous Vide. We're all about helping you get the most out of your sous vide machine while talking to some of the biggest names in the industry. Till next time, I'm Jason Logston.